All right, welcome to the Canadian Philosophy Show. My name's Tegan Marshall, and I am here with three esteemed co-hosts. And for tonight's introduction, we're going to be speaking about uh, Platonic theories and Plato himself. So I want to ask my esteemed co-hosts, what was the first philosophy course you took, and what impact did it have on you? We'll start with, with Michael Robert Cadiz, a.k.a. Mikey. My first class was uh, probably a few years before your first classes, so I get to go first. My first class was actually a religion class, which is in the philosophy department at, at VIU, and it was mm -hmm. a New Testament critical Bible study. And what did it do for me? Um, it actually uh, caused me to appreciate the complexity and the rich amount of like history and information there is in the in the Bible, and I'm not a religious person, but it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's it's always good to know the social, social and historical elements of of religious texts, whether you back them or not. That's for sure. All right, we'll go over to Mark. <laughs> well, um, I, I think to me it's uh. Uh, my first class was a metaphysics class, actually. So, yeah, I think that just really put me into a, I think, a very critical, like, uh, thinking of different theories. So I, I feel like maybe sometimes I will perhaps be stuck at the premises rather than, you know, looking at the whole picture or whatever. But I, I try my best, you know. Yeah, thanks, Mark. That was Mark Giles. Thing oh. he didn't fully introduce himself. No, right. <laughs> no problem, Mark. Now we'll go over to Nicole Kurgan, aka Nikki. Tell us yeah, about your hi. first class. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my name is Nicole Kurgan. Um, I guess like I'll start with my favorite. I guess like my most memorable class because I can't remember my first philosophy class to be honest. Um, at this point, but, um. My most memorable class it is um, science and society that I took at Douglas College, and that class um, taught me how to think in different ways about um, scientific literature and even like just regular analytic statements, like saying saying like oh this is proven by by X Y and Z or whatever. Like it was actually the biggest change in the way that I think about different issues because one one thing stood out in particular was like that you can't use the word proven when you are talking about scientific research because of the problem of induction. And that was just the, the most memorable thing that I've learned. And it sounds very arbitrary, but it was the thing that really stuck with me. And that was also the first class that I ever, that I tried to transcribe everything that the professor said into notes and it actually ended up working out really well. So yeah, that's my most memorable class, and I would assume that my first class would have been critical thinking, which is pretty standard amongst philosophy students. Indeed. Thanks, Nicole. And, I mean, most of you guys already know who I am, but I am Tegan Marshall. I am a Vancouver Island University student, and my first philosophy class was... Hmm... It was knowledge and reality. And so it was very impactful for me to have those initial conversations about, well, you know, what what is reality? So looking at looking at our our, our good friend Plato, for example, and 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 how he looked at the world, looking at Rene Descartes and his his ideas and his kind of dualistic ideas a little bit of, of how do we determine what reality is and of course the famous Cartesian statement, I think, therefore I am. I don't know how valid that statement is. There's certainly some criticism to that simplistic nature of that statement, but that's another show entirely. So yeah, knowledge and reality was was definitely a experience. I wish I hadn't done it in my first year, though, because I was a major deer in headlights at that moment. But, you know, welcome to first year university, folks. You'll all get there. 
All right. So now that we've gotten the introductions out of the way, out of the way, it's always fun to get to know our co-hosts a little more, I think. We're now going to switch and we're going to do a bit of time traveling. All the way back to 300 BC. We're going to talk about Plato. And honestly, for most of us, or at least maybe that's a faulty assumption, Plato is generally one of the first philosophers you're introduced to because of his um, fundamental contribution. In fact, he's generally regarded as the first, even though I'm sure there were some before. In fact, we know the name of some of them, but I can't recall at the moment. Um, he's the first major philosopher, philosophical text that we start to get out of the Islamic Empire, actually, that then gets promulgated through Europe during the Middle Ages period. So he's, he, he is, um, his dialogues and his writings are super key to our discipline. So we, we'd be amiss not to do a show dedicated to Plato. So what I want to talk about tonight is more, more general, but I do have some specifics I want to talk about. I want to talk first of all about the four cardinal virtues. Um, the, the four cardinal virtues being, in no particular order, wisdom, temperance, courage, and justice. So I want to I want to talk about that, and then once we talk about that, we can talk about how that implements into um, Socrates' discourse, and Socrates' discourse on justice. What does justice look like? How do we pursue justice? It is justice um, a thing of strength and a thing of of power, or is justice knowledge and pursuit of a higher calling, which is, in a sense, outside of ourselves? And then that leads into a discussion of how we prepare ourselves to pursue that calling, if that's it. And we might have some debate about that as we go through that discourse. And then I want to finish it off with one of the first philosophy paper topics I ever wrote about and that is the parable or the story of Gaiji's ring which I will explain more at the time but so let's let's begin um, now that I've outlined our evening let's begin with talking about the four cardinal virtues I think what I'll do is I will um, go through each one, and then once I've kind of given my opinion and viewpoints on each one, I will then open open the floor to panel discussion on the importance and the impact of the four cardinal virtues in general, but maybe even to us as strictly individuals. So let's begin with, well, the first one I can recall which is wisdom. For, for Socrates, for Plato, wisdom is central. And what does wisdom really equal? Wisdom really equals reason. Um, the ability to be rational in our thought processes, to work through problems and scenarios, to to really understand the complexities of a given situation or conversation is key for Plato as he um, writes down Socrates' dialogue. And, and within these dialogues, the dialogues I'll be referring to, um, not with quotes or anything, but just for your own personal interest, will be from... Uh, Plato's book, The Republic. The Republic is kind of 
one of the main works we study in philosophy generally, but there are many great, uh, great, there's a number of great works that Plato has written that we have, but tonight I'll be using the Republic. So the ability to rationalize, the ability to understand your opponent's position within a, with, within, within a debate. Now, one thing I want to point out is the fact that the Greeks and Socrates and Plato, I don't think, in fact, they wouldn't. They would not call um, the, the, the discussions they have debates. They would call them a dialogue. Debate nowadays has taken on, taken on kind of this, this persona of it being a fiery exchange, a, a fiery exchange which is highly emotional, um, which is and highly also adversarial, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You are opposing sides, therefore you are enemies. The main, the main point of the Platonic dialogues is to not see each other as enemies, but is to understand each other's position in an attempt, if not to win them over to your perspective. But even when I say win them over, that's, that's not entirely accurate. It is, to, it is to convince and persuade and help your, your colleague that you're, you're, you're conversing with to see the value in your perspective. And then hopefully as they understand your rationale as they understand your approach then they will also accept that approach but there's no necessary requirement that you are trying to win an argument rather you are presenting your position in the hopes that truth and rationale would reign supreme so the pursuit of wisdom is absolutely paramount because that shapes our very interactions we have with one another and this is where where the the next kind of virtue comes in i think as well even though he may um plato may not be fully discussing just emotional temperance i think it applies so the second the second Virtue of temperance, meaning yes, to be to be you know moderate in alcohol usage and stuff like that for sure, probably, but also to be temperate in the way we utilize our emotions, because our emotions are not what is required and is not helpful all the time in forming meaningful. Um, meaningful and productive conversation because our emotions will cloud our ability to reason on a certain subject. So take, for example, um, hmm, what's a non-controversial one? Oh, heck, let, let, let's, go, let's go controversial. So say we're dealing with a hot button issue such as immigration and we won't we won't get into that debate that's not what this show is for but that that is a very emotional topic for a majority of people um either on one side or the other um because it's highly it's highly personal most of us know people who have either immigrated themselves or know someone who has. And so it's a highly volatile issue. And, and Plato recognizes that. But what he presents is the importance of having, having, um, having yourself in order, making your house in order. And so how does he do this? This is taking us on a bit of a detour, but it's a detour we need to take. It, it's, it's the fact that Plato divides the soul into three parts. 
that of the mind. So reason and our ability to 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 take in information and work with it and and take up a position. Spirit. So so our our drive, our kind of motivation um, to to do things, to act on things. And then our desire. So whatever our desire is. So whether that is, you know, um, in this context, it's to, you know, say convince your your colleague that your position is true and more logical and accurate. Um, but chief among these are our reason, because our emotions are are. Our emotions, they're intense, they're volatile. But for a person to pursue the benefit of a conversation like that, reason must be paramount. Um, because that is what allows us to be the most receptive, um, to better understand the other individual's position. So I hope that makes sense, and, and if not... Uh, feel free to ask a question. Um, e yeah, actually, let's just see if there's any brief questions now, and then I'll just move on to the last two virtues real quick. Yeah. I Thank you, Tegan. Yeah, thanks, Tegan. I have a comment from Miguel uh, on YouTube. The dialogue was a method to work toward recollection of the truth as is in the world of forms. It was a journey to go on together, uh, not in opposition to each other. So, uh, so that that comment um, reinforces what you're saying, um, yeah. Tegan. That Plato's idea of uh, Socratic dialogue wasn't enemies battling it out, but it was rather a rational dialogue where there may be differences of opinion and belief and different approaches. Mm -hmm but with the common goal of finding truth, in fact, in fact uh, re recollection of truth, because Plato believed that, that um, humans have inside of them somewhere, they may have forgotten truth uh, yeah. as exists in the world of forms, but, but it can be recollected, they can recollect truth. So with respect to justice, uh, in, the mean, in the Mino, in the, Plato's book, The Mino, uh, Mino and Plato are in a Socratic dialogue about what is the meaning of justice. And that's something that you're asking about. So what Plato points out in that dialogue with Mino is that there's a distinction between justice as a form and an instance of justice. And the, the, the world of forms is very important because that is where the ideal form of justice, the ideal form of a human, the ideal form of a tree, the ideal form of everything exists in this world of forms. And what we experience are simply instances of, of justice or instances of people, but, they're, but those are distinct from the actual form. So, uh, so we can talk about justice and what are some of the characteristics of justice as, uh, or whatever we're di discussing, whatever we're in dialogue about, we can um, mutually uh, try and pursue uh, what the pure form of, of, of the thing we're discussing is uh, as it would be in that world of forms. Yeah. So thanks, Mikey, for that. I appreciate that. Thanks, Miguel. Really appreciate your insights into that. It's, it's, uh, we're, we're happy to have that insight. That was a wonderful insight. Mm -hmm. So, I have yeah. a question, I guess. Um, Go ahead. So, Go. about Plato, yeah, for clarification, I never really fully understood this point in my classes, but for the for the Greeks, um, the ancient Greeks that were following uh, the Platonic tradition, right? Would it be ever possible to r truly emulate the the form, any form, like the form of an apple, the form of justice, the form of whatever love? in real life or like how close can you actually get to that idealistic picture what I, I don't know mark if if you want to take this but i'll just quickly quickly say my thought 
is that for for the ancient Greeks, right, you have to go back even further to to the you know to the ancient Greek religions of the time and, and the wheel of torment. So as much as as much as we can pursue pursue the form of justice, right? We are unable to fully actualize that because of our limitations, because of our 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 existence within the human realm. Um, but Plato would would say that that it is possible to strive to emulate in in as many facets as possible. What 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 do you think, Mark? Um. Yeah. I mean. Okay. So. I, I can give my understanding of it at least, and well, the the short answer is uh, like to your question is no, Nikki. Um, well, actually, it sort of depends. Um, and it has to do with uh, like at least Socrates' uh, view on art. So, uh, the forms, from my understanding, is sort of like something that exists in an immaterial realm, right? Which is where Plato thinks that you know the soul comes from, right? And that's why that you need to, like, you, like, remember, like, knowledge, right? You don't actually learn it. And in this sense, right, there's all these imperfect things down here in the world. And, you know, we look at them, right? We might look at a straight line, right? But if we look very closely, we can see it's always jagged. And, in fact, uh, I guess all everything we find in the material world here, I guess, or the world we exist in, let's say, is uh, Im- imperfect. So this contrast to, uh, with uh, Plato's uh, theory of the forms, right, where they are actually perfect things that exist, you know, separate here. And um, this sort of leads me to my, why I said, like, no, but not, but maybe, but like, not really, I don't know, but like, just put an asterisk there. And it has to do with, uh, I guess, Socrates' view on art. Right. So he was very critical of, I guess, non-abstract art in the sense that, you know, it sort of guides people in a sense incorrectly or it sort of is quite, can be quite elusive to them and that people can get sort of obsessed with like a representation rather than like the actual thing in itself. So like take for example like maybe like uh you have a like a friend who like cries at whenever they watch like a romantic comedy movie, right? You know, in, in a certain sense you can say to them, you how how dumb is that, right? You know, you're crying over something that's not even real. And instead of pursuing the thing which you want, which is you know of course like a true love right in the romantic comedy, you're instead just watching a movie about it. So that, that sort of was, uh, I guess, Socrates' critique of art. And the thing is, it doesn't really apply to abstract art. And I think there is, and Schopenhauer sort of makes this argument sort of about music as well. And I think it applies to abstract art specifically. Um, in that w- when, you're, like, in, when you're perceiving or like abstract art, including music, right, you're not actually perceiving a representation of something, right? You know, an abstract art painting is a painting, but it's not a painting of something, right? In the same sense that a painting of a tree would be of something. You're instead actually, I guess, witnessing the thing itself, right? You're not paying attention to some representation. So I think in that sense, there is a, well, real, real sense in which you grasp perhaps the form in itself. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, I would actually, I'm interested to see if Mikey has any um, thoughts on this as well. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about where Plato goes in the Republic, but I, want, I think it's a little bit early to, to go there, so I'll wait until a little bit later. But I, I, I believe Plato's going someplace, and, and of course in the Republic he um, offers a model for how he thinks society should be politically structured based on... Um, Mm-hmm. these four principles but but I'll but we'll get there later I want to go back to Tegan and let him continue with his uh, uh, continue with his track because I think it's a good one 
time's always ticking and so i always have i it's the ultimate struggle of a radio program how do we get through it all in such a little amount of time this is why we have degrees and graduate programs for this folks but philosophy is a lifelong discipline. You never escape it once you're into it. Because um, you're always wondering. <laughs> okay. So, back to this. We've covered, we've covered temperance. We've covered wisdom. Now we have to get to courage and justice. So, courage is next. What is courage? Good question. Courage. I think for Plato and Socrates. So for anyone who is wondering who the heck is this Socrates guy, Socrates was Plato's mentor. And so Plato is writing down some instances that he witnessed with Socrates. Um, throughout the Republic. So courage is your ability to act. That's what courage is. Your ability to, to stand and to take these concepts and apply them and utilize them. Uh, that, um, yeah, your courage to act your ability to act and your ability to perceive and act on the concepts which we've been discussing. But the thing is, if you, if you act on these things and if you talk about these things, it's somewhat controversial. Um, philosophy is a controversial subject. And so much so that, uh, that Socrates literally goes to his death because of these conversations um, because he's critical of the societal thought of the time um, and then we get to we get to justice there's a lot of talk in the world right now about what justice is and what it isn't justice is the pursuit of the good for the betterment of society. That's what justice is. Justice, I mean, it sounds simple, but it's quite complex. Justice is every individual moving towards the common goal, the common good. And what is the good? The good is what strengthens and benefits society as a whole. Not just what is good for the majority or the minority, but for everybody. And I think we've lost sight of that concept of justice. To, because very rarely in, in society do we think about a common good or a common pursuit. Because we moved from a a cult, from a more community centered, society centered to an individual, and this is where going back to the three parts of the soul, that organization, that your reason be paramount, and then your spirit would come next, and then your desire would come last, is so important because within reason you can then enter into these dialogues and discover and work through, and it's difficult to work through, what the good is. And so these are the four cardinal virtues. I'll just say them one more time. Uh, wisdom. So as we talked about, uh, the pursuit of, of reason, the ability to exercise reason, to understand your your colleague's position and to critique your own um, temperance being being temperate in our emotions and our responses um, but also possibly um, it basically means to be to be 
to be balanced, to be able to rationalize, again, going back to rationality, um, to remain even keel despite the circumstances. Um, then we get, then we get to, um, <laughs> oh dear, what, what, what's the next one? Uh, I just did, I just uh, Courage? Did. Or, yeah, okay, there we go. Courage, <laughs> courage is next. So the ability to act upon, upon these things that we've discussed. And then finally, we get to justice. So that that is partially that is put putting aside our own interests, our own ambitions, our own desires for the betterment of society, and to enter into a discussion about what that is. That at its core, the recognition of the good and the pursuit of betterment of society, that is justice. Who disagrees with me? Let's go to... I can... first. All right. Um, well, I don't know. I, I guess I just have a couple of thoughts or maybe questions. I don't think I disagree per se. Um, and I, I think it's just maybe perhaps a question of like what what do you do when you like notions perhaps conflict? So I, I remember like um because I I, I actually have a philosophy course um right now where we're sort of talking about uh, much more contemporary like metaphysics, social metaphysics. And there's sort of a like a branch sort of um where it, it the, it's to do with the like philosophy of gender and race, where it's not trying to be descriptive or like necessarily portray, um, I guess the, those things as they are, but perhaps how they should be talked about, I guess. And you know, for the arguments, right? They don't give any like descriptive arguments. They give like normative ones, right? And this sort of leads me to my question where like, well, it seems to be at this point, there's a sort of an intersection, I guess, between describing how things are and perhaps describing them in a way that's not entirely true in order to better society. And maybe like a better example would be like, should you actively write history as it is or in a way that would perhaps better society so that there would not be as many, um, I guess, cultural issues, right? That perhaps have their base in historical conflicts. Can Can I briefly just respond to that? Of course, so that, I, that is my question, uh, yeah. Well, let, let's begin with truth is truth. Um, <laughs> Plato and Aristotle would never dispute that truth is truth. Um, because the good is ultimately the pursuit of truth, and it's the pursuit of truth which will benefit society. So, to answer your question, Mark, I don't think it's a case of altering history to better society. Rather, it's to understand the truth of the history, and then possibly looking at that and saying, okay, what can we learn from this experience? Or, or what, what can be gleaned to then better understand how we must move as a society forward? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure I'm following. Um, let me see. Um, but it still sort of seems like you have this conflict where it seems like maybe not sharing, like, it, the the issue that I'm having is that the way that would may perhaps best like uh, that society would live best by might be like an untruthful one rather than a truthful one, I guess. Right. Did, did that did that uh, sort of not understand? Did I misunderstand your answer or? 
Maybe you know, something I'm yeah, overlooking. I, I understand. I understand what you're saying. I think. I think what what I'll say though is, for for Socrates and for Plato, the good that I just spoke about requires the pursuit of truth as truth. Um, and so, to so even though that truth, the pursuit of truth is what will better society. It's not necessarily how we perceive the truth. It is the actual pursuit of truth, which leads to the better of society. Perhaps, but... But, but I, I see your difficulty in the sense that what, what may be the best for society may not equal the 100% un, unwatered, you know. Uh, I, I think I get what you're getting at. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe I might have a bit of an issue with how Socrates defines goodness. I guess oh, I don't know, but I mean, uh, it sort of seems like it has the notion of truth baked into it. Which maybe I mean I I know that like they had the idea that I forget how it goes exactly, but something that all forms had their basis in what they called goodness or something. So maybe. It, works in like that but i i would imagine it has it with truth because it sort of is presupposed in i guess every statement and the rationality but yeah right. it's a different question okay so so mikey do you want to weigh in i'm just looking at the time and i just know there's a few more things um i want to get to but i want to make sure that you have an opportunity and Nikki, if you want, you have an opportunity to jump in there as well. I'll let Mikey go first if he has anything to, he wants to say. This all sounds very uh, anthropocentric to me, that, that one should like forego his or her own interest for the good of society. <clears throat> I'm just wondering if, if that extends to animals and to plants and to the earth as an ecosystem, whether we should also pay attention to the good of other beings besides human beings. Did, did Plato think about that, or was Plato only thinking about humans as being well, what matters? Pla Plato, Plato, and Ar I mean Aristotle certainly thought about this, and Aristotle would say that that human beings are set apart by virtue of our apparent ability to reason this comes out of the politics by aristotle that because of our ability to reason and verbally communicate and understand moral codes and stuff like that and being able to form a society that that sets humans above the animals because of their ability to produce speech their ability of logos so i think it would be although it is important to note that um, Aristotle, even though he was trained by Plato, does break away from traditional Platonic thinking in, in his philosophies and his works. That, does that kind of answer your question, Mikey? Obviously, there's more to that, that discussion. Yeah, I was just thinking about how the roots of Western philosophy contain this hierarchy that you were describing and that mm. we can see we can trace that hierarchy through western philosophy up to the current time we certainly saw it in the medieval times with the the great chain of being right so the uh, the, the great catholic <clears throat> philosophers of medieval times placed hum god at the top angels below god and below angels were people then on down the line and one could argue that that's one of the reasons why humans have been so hard on the environment and hard on uh, uh, you know hard, hard, hard on other life forms besides humans because of that hierarchical idea which we can trace back to the you know play uh, the original Western philosophers anyway that's all I wanted to say I'll, I'll let you continue or let let's hand it over to uh, to Nicole to make a comment yeah um, I would like to say Mikey that that is um, 
your point on how um, the Plato's theory of justice is anthropocentric, I think that's a very interesting point, and I'm happy that you brought that up because I also see that. Um, one, I guess, my input that I would add here regarding the uh, the tenet that one should forgo their own interests um, for the betterment of society. I, I see a lot of similarities between Plato's theory of justice and John Rawls' theory of justice. And I don't know how much he was influenced by Plato um, per se, but um, I'll, give a, I'll give a short summary of what John Rawls um, proposed. So one of John, uh, to give a background of who John Rawls is, he's arguably the most well-known political philosopher in the analytic tradition. Um, so, and he's relatively contemporary, but I don't think he's um, alive anymore, but he, I believe he did his works in, in, in the 1900s. Um, so he's, he is relatively, um, contemporary in that regard. So, and that's, I guess, compared to Plato, who was in 300 BC. So relatively contemporary there. Anyway, um, the first principle that John Rawls talks about is that each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive scheme of equal basic liberties compatible with the similar scheme of liberties for others. So that so that means that what uh, people who get um, their basic liberties, the other people should be able to get those liberties too, basically, right? And then the second principle that he articulates, and this one's a little bit more complex, is that social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both um, are to be at the greatest benefit to the least advantaged members of society and attached to the positions and offices open to all. So that's, um, that's a very basic summary of John Rawls. And the theory that he's the most well known for, or the, I guess the, his contribution to philosophy is um, the veil of ignorance. And um, you might've heard this before because it is quite well known, but uh, to summarize what the veil of ignorance is, it's basically it's basically a thought experiment for policymakers when they're trying to they, when they're trying to account for justice when they're making policy decisions. So the thought experiment is: imagine yourself that you don't know your social status, you don't know, for example, your race, gender, class, um, economics. You don't know anything anything about yourself. Um, so you put yourself under that veil of ignorance and what decisions then would you make um, policy wise for people based on that would you make decisions that are trying to for the betterment of one social group or economic group or would you try to make everything uh, equitable or equitable for all so that's that's kind of what he's talking about and i see a lot of similarities um between plato's view that we we're talking about and john rawls's view and um, you guys can feel free to jump on this if you want, or you can move on. 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe this ties back to Mikey too, but if I, re if I remember correctly, I, I remember that John Rawls sort of excludes animals from his, like, veil of ignorance, like, thought experiment, which I... I don't. I think he does it on the grounds that they're not like they don't have moral intuitions or something like that. Um, which I I don't think is true. I mean, I I've clearly seen dogs like look incredibly guilty after like you know I know eating the trash, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I know of, of course people are saying like you know you can be like the skeptic, right? And, and you can say, oh well, you know they may be doing it because they want to take pity of their owners, right? But, you know, they clearly have a sense of mm. more empathy, right? Which I, I'd say is the basis of mor morality, right? And they clearly look after yeah. puppies. I guess you right can there. apply psychological egoism to dogs. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. I mean, yeah. But I know, I feel like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just always sort of, I don't know, thought it was a bit unfair of roles to just you know exclude animals on the basis of that yeah and i think that's very similar to plato's and all of even the medieval philosophers is views that they're they're all very anthropocentric and i think that a lot of these animal welfare views of course there are there are likely views before it got popularized but it really became popular um in this in contemporary times so 
it is a quite new in philosophy to be considering animal and environmental rights. And I think it should be involved in these conversations. By the way, um, m many, many great Western philosophers didn't include women either in the uh, m moral, rational community, um, in, uh, particularly Kant. <laughs> I, I thought Kant did. Did he? No, not? no, no. He did. No, m women did not count. Okay. They were not in part of the moral community. Um, I'm not sure what Plato's position on women was. But, uh, yeah. We are veering off topic. Yeah. Go ahead. Take it away, Tegan. With back, go back on track. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it's a it's a good discussion, and these are topics which we can discuss at later dates. Um, I did want to make sure. Because I'm selfish like that, that we just get through all the material that, that we have planned. Um, so we're going to briefly, 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 briefly talk about the theory of justice. So there is a discourse in the Republic between Socrates and Thrasymachus. Um, if, you, if you look that up, I'm sure you'll find the... Um, just look up... Uh, Socrates and Thrasymachus, uh, justice di uh, yeah, dialogue, you'll probably find it. We will also post a link on our Facebook page and even here in the YouTube comments uh, so you can find it. The crux of this, this dialogue is essentially Thrasymachus argues that justice can only be executed through exhibits of strength and actual power within society. Mm -hmm. That that is how justice is executed. And I think within society, um, that is generally how justice, at least on the ground, is dealt with, obviously. Um, if you're attaining a violent person, you're going to use physical strength to retain them. However, the issue becomes, is that in itself justice? And Socrates replies with no, because justice is, is being able to understand the complexity of the situation and then rule according to the, to the situation. And that can only be done through reason not any physical means. So to execute justice is to use wisdom and to use our reason to determine a suitable response. Now, there's far more to that, to that dialogue than just presented and so on and so forth. But um, basically, one is physical strength equals justice, where Plato... And so well, Socrates, Plato writes the thing, says that it is the strength of knowledge and understanding that we have that allows us to understand and then execute justice accordingly. Um, that that it that it isn't something physical; rather, it is something mental that is executed. Because you are able to look at the situation and then choose how to respond accordingly based on the complexities of that situation. Really quickly, does that make sense? Yeah, I wanted to point out that, um, again, referring to John Rawls, that another thing that Rawls got from Plato was this idea of rationality and dialogue being the basis for action and for power uh, and for political decisions rather than fighting, you know, rather than either physical violence or, um, or, or brute force. And Rawls got that from Plato. I'm sure he was influenced by Plato when Rawls uh, proposes theory of the overlapping consensus, which is that what, what would hold a society together would be consensus based on rationality rather than whoever has the most brute force and whoever has the, the most brute power. Mm. But I also need to point out a, a major um, distinction 
between Plato and Rawls, it's major. So while they agreed on the, the idea of rational discourse as being a basis for ruling a society, Plato, and this is where he goes in the Republic, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but Plato argues that only philosophers have that capability. Therefore, philosophers should be the rulers. Whereas Rawls comes yeah. to a very different conclusion, which is that democracy is the yes. the natural way yes. to implement this the, this uh, this rational way of ruling. Yeah. They, they're very different in that. Yeah, go ahead, Dagan. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I'm gonna speed through Gaiji's ring, and maybe we can get back to that. Actually, I'll touch on it now, just so it's touched on, and we can we sh we should probably revisit that in a few future shows at some point. Um, is what Socrates describes as the ideal city. So the the rulers of the ideal city are the philosophers because they are they are seen to be the supreme the supreme you know well they're the kings right because they are able to reason and and discuss and rationalize the issues that rise in in the city and then um you know spirit is represented within within the peasants right the, their 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 drives and they're going about day to day life and, you know doing their jobs and so on and so forth but then you get to the pigs this this city is actually called the city of pigs and the pigs are those that are driven strictly by their desires um, their 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 passions is a better way to understand it. Uh, whether that be their sexual passions or their passions for power, their their passions for all these things, which as which Plato ultimately says or seems to allude to, that if that was all we were, it would destroy us. Um, because those those left to their own devices do not do not better us as people they they only they only um consume us so this leads perfectly into ooh gaiji's ring real quick gaiji's ring is the is is a story that socrates presents and the story goes like this this is going to be the fastest fastest story time ever so there, there 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 is this man and he's hanging out with his friends and his associates actually he's a shepherd and i think one of his sheep goes missing and he finds he finds this cave that he thinks the sheep has the yeah the sheep has wandered into and so he goes but he doesn't find the sheep but you know what he does find treasure he finds he finds lots and lots of treasure and he's like, "Ooh, this is nice." <laughs> and he finds this ring, and 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 he has this desire for this ring. Kind of sounds like Lord of the Rings, doesn't? And and he, oh, it gets better. It really almost does go Lord of the Rings style in a second. He finds the ring. He, you know, whatever. He finds the sheep. Possibly, I can't remember. He goes back that night. He's drinking with his buddies. Having a good time, you know, after the sheep shift. And <laughs> and he he puts on the ring. And his friends say, Hey, where did that guy go? He can't be seen. He's invisible. See very Lord of the Rings ish. And he then proceeds to be filled with these desires, these passions which consume him kind of sounds like Gollum, doesn't it and it consumes him to the point where his desire for power leads him to join the military which then gets him to a high appointment he then slaughters the king and sleeps with his wife and this is what socrates uses to suggest or at least the question I had to answer in my paper was can a man who is in possession of that much power 
remain just? Can he remain ordered? Or will he fall into the trap of those desires? And fundamentally, you know, to take it metaphysically, you know, no man is free from free from sin metaphysically. Um, so it's it's te we're tempted to fall into that. Um, Socrates would also say would say that if that man is not truly ordered in the pursuit of reason, right? Because what happens in this man is that structure gets gets moved around. His desires then take the chief position, and his reason otherwise. And so my, my quick answer, and I think uh, Socrates' answer, is quite simply no. Okay, we have, we have like a minute, so I'm going to do a like one to two sentence round table. Mark, go. What are your thoughts on that? Um, geez, that's a lot to talk about. Um, I'm not too sure what I would say exactly. I mean, I feel like... There are people who, you know, given the power of such a ring, perhaps, I, I, I could at least envision some people not falling to power. But I do, I think there is a very certain sense in which power does corrupt in that if you get into the habit of doing something, you know, it's very hard to break such a habit. Mm -hmm. Mikey? It all sounds very patriarchal to me. I think... Uh... I, maybe what applies to men wouldn't apply to women. You know, we have examples of uh, of uh, matriarchal societies where the very few of them, but there are some, and there's some in the bonobo um, community of uh, apes where women are in charge and they don't work at all like like men work. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's my comment. Yeah. Nicole. <laughs> yeah. Um, my comment is that um, I can see the merits of what Plato is doing here. Um, with the theory of justice. Um, and I, I see that, you know, he, they, he narrowed down certain virtues that he was focusing on. And what I, my question would be is, can, are, are those virtues still uh, applicable to our contemporary times? Mm. Okay. All right. My name is Taylor Marshall. This has been the Canadian Philosophy Show here with my co-host, Michael Robert Gaitz, Mark Giles, and Nicole Kiergan. Tune in next week when we revisit disability, activism, and philosophy. Until next time, we're the Canadian Philosophy Show, TCPS. We'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.